we're finally here. Shelby has just finished the 66 GT350 model year run and they're getting ready to gear up for the 1967 Shelby. They're completely redesigning the 67 GT350 and introducing a new model, the GT500. So let's step into the lounge and talk about what happened to the 1967 Shelby. The man, Carol Shelby, engineer, race driver. The car, the Shelby Mustang GT. model year run was chock full of ups and downs for the GT350. However, just like any other auto manufacturer, you can't dwell too much on the past. You need to look at the lessons learned and get ready for the next year's model. So, in mid-1966, the crew began working on designing the next evolution of the Mustang GT350. This new Shelby model was going to have a completely different feel from its predecessors. While the 1965 GT350 laid the foundation as a no-nonsense performance car, the 1966 GT350 introduced a somewhat softer side to the lineup and increased the overall popularity of the Shelby Mustang to the public. But for the 1967 model year run, Carroll Shelby wanted to make the Shelby Mustang a true grand touring car. I mean, if you look at it, GT cars are in Shelby's DNA. He cut his racing teeth driving GT cars for Maserati and Aston Martin. Let's take a look at exactly what a Grand Touring car is. Defined by Wikipedia, a Grand Tour, or GT, is a type of sports car that is designed for high speed and long distance driving due to a combination of performance and luxury attributes. The most common format is a front engine, rear wheel drive, two door coupe, with either a two seat or a two plus two arrangement. Now, I had said in an earlier video that the 1965 GT350 was a pure GT car. And I'm going to have to back off of that original statement simply because the GT350 up until now hasn't met the textbook definition. They're definitely built for high speed and you can obviously drive them for long distances if you like but there's no way you're going to do it in comfort and luxury. 1967 was the first step in the direction of building a real GT car. Carroll Shelby wanted to see young executives who would normally drive Ferraris go with something American built and more interesting, and that would be the Shelby GT. One of the advantages Shelby had for the Grand Tour was that Ford was redesigning the Mustang for the 67 model year and they were planning a larger Mustang to accommodate a larger engine. Since April 17, 1964, when the first Mustang hit the streets, the other auto manufacturers were working on competitors of their own. One of the first such competitors was the Chevy Camaro and Pontiac Firebird that featured much larger engines. In 1966, the biggest full tilt engine the Mustang had was a 271 horsepower 289 V8. The GT350 had that same engine, bumped up to 306 horsepower. When Chevrolet released their 1967 Camaro, the base V8 option began with 327 cubic inches at 210 horsepower and an upgrade to 275 horsepower. That's just the base engine. If you wanted their factory race car, then you'd opt for the Z28, and that was equipped with a pretty potent 302 that cranked out 290 horsepower. Next was the 350 that made 295 horsepower, followed by their 396 big block that started at 325 horsepower and offered an upgrade that cranked out 375 horsepower. Pontiac offered just one V8 for the Firebird, and it was 400 cubic inches, making 340 horsepower. Either way you look at it, the Firebird had the Mustang covered and the Camaro had only one engine that made less horsepower than the Mustang's top engine. Needless to say, Ford had their work cut out for them. 
they needed to design the next Mustang to accept the bigger engine, namely Ford's 390 cubic inch FE engine that made 335 horsepower. I mean, it's not 375, but it's a start. While Ford engineers designed a larger engine compartment to accommodate big blocks, the entire car ended up getting larger overall. A larger car led to a more spacious interior, wider stance, and like its predecessor, the 1967 was available in a coupe and convertible, and Ford improved upon the 2 Plus 2 by giving the Mustang a true fastback roof line. However, while Ford was planning for their new Mustang, Ford executives were also making plans for Shelby American. You see, the team at Shelby American had a lot on their plate as they came into the 1967 model year. According to documents from the 1965 model year run, Shelby American entered the year $311,000 in the hole. After the 1966 model year run, the Hertz program brought in a profit of $310,000. Had it not been for the Hertz program possibly continuing for 1967 and possibly some creative accounting, Shelby American would have most likely ended up out of business. However, Shelby American was on track to sustain an operating loss of $764,000 for 1967, something Ford did not want to hear. Also, Shelby American had a contract with Ford that didn't require them to pay for any of the cars they had in their inventory until they sold. So, Shelby's entire inventory was pretty much owned by Ford, which means that Ford had a ton of money tied up into Shelby, whose return investment depended upon sales. That, coupled with the many launch problems that plagued production in the past, the ever-growing operation that not only included the GT350 Mustangs, but also the GT40 program and Trans Am effort to name a few. This caused Ford to want to step in to hopefully keep production going and protect their investment. Ford called in Charlie McHose. Charlie started his life at the Ford Motor Company of England as a designer and later migrated to Detroit. He worked on several design jobs for Ford, including the original Mustang, but in May of 1966, he got the call to go to the West Coast and work with the Shelby design team in developing the new look for the Shelby GT. He was given one of Shelby's test vehicles, a 65 GT350 to drive around, and immediately went to work. Also joining Shelby from Ford was Ray Geddes, who took control of the parts ordering process in October, and Fred Goodell as chief engineer in December of 1966. The team at Shelby American had quite a few plans for their 1967 model. First, they were looking to increase the lineup with the addition of a convertible mid-year and possibly a coupe as well. Next, they wanted to increase the line even further with the big block version of the GT350. Furthermore, the team wanted to differentiate their grand touring car from your standard Mustang, and Charlie was the man for the task. One of the biggest complaints about the previous GT350 was that it looked like an ordinary Mustang with stripes, nothing special. Fortunately, Charlie had a plethora of sketches and drawings that would ultimately determine the new look, distinguishing the Shelby from the normal Mustang. To go along with the unique looks, Shelby removed every reference to the Mustang from the car, meaning no horses, no Mustang nameplate. Instead, a newly designed Cobra with full fangs, coiled and ready to strike, became the new look. With the new look brought a new name. Hence, this new car was no longer referred to as a Mustang GT350 anymore, but a Shelby GT350. When it comes to getting your money's worth, looks are everything. And if this new Shelby was going to survive, it had to look smart, aggressive and exclusive without looking like a Mustang with bolt-ons. Back then, automotive designers made their prototypes out of clay, and working with clay was Charlie's specialty. But in order to build prototypes, you needed a test car. So, Ford obliged by sending Shelby American a pre-production partial Mustang body Shelby could use as a base design for body parts. This body was used for seatbelt testing at Ford, and, well, it wasn't going to be a production car, so why not let Shelby use it? 
Ford also sent two fastback bodies made out of fiberglass. Once they arrived at the LA airport facilities, McCoe's and team literally had to manhandle these bare bodies through several office spaces, up a flight of stairs, and down a long, narrow corridor before they came to rest inside the design studio in the back. The plan was for Charlie to design a new look for the 67 Shelby using clay, and then the new pieces would be fashioned out of fiberglass and installed at Shelby American once the cars arrived from Ford. McHose didn't have a whole lot of time to work with, and while the team at Shelby American was extremely proficient, Charlie cruised over to his alma mater, Art Center College of Design, which happened to be practically up the street, and recruited his art instructor, Joe Farrer. Together, they would tag team the design and prototyping process, joined shortly thereafter by Carl Nassen from Ford. The trio worked round the clock to design the new body pieces and then model them in clay. They had to work quickly because Big Hose had to go back to Michigan in August. In previous years, the GT350 kept 100% of the Mustang sheet metal. For 1967, McHose and company completely redesigned the nose that gave the car a different look that used two outboard low beam lights and two inboard high beam lights while retaining the stock front bumper. However, upon inspection, Carroll Shelby liked the new nose but wanted it stretched to give it a longer and sleeker look. Starting again from scratch, they came up with a longer nose, but with the added length, the front openings became smaller and thus the Mustang headlights no longer fit. Fortunately, the remedy came in a set of 1960 Galaxy headlights that were just the right size. The longer nose called for a longer hood that incorporated a better looking scoop and did a great job blending into the lines of the hood. The louvers or vents on either sides of the scoop were originally planned to go on big block AC cars but ended up being distributed to cars randomly. Overall, the front end had the aggressive and sleek look with a touch of class, not to mention exclusivity. The plan for the sides of the car was to stick with the brake scoop and quarter window design that really seemed to be a winner with the 1966 GT350. However, the new shape of the fastback roof line made for some goofy looking side quarter windows. After some research and deliberation, McHose took a cue from the momentum that was the most recent 1-2-3 win at Le Mans and incorporated another pair of scoops that were reminiscent of the scoops on the winning car, the Mark II Ford GT40. These scoops, however, didn't route cooling air to the brakes. Instead, they acted as functioning air extractors for the interior. Also incorporated into the scoops were eye-level brake and turn signal lights. These lights were way ahead of their time. I mean, most folks would call these mere running lights, but they flashed with the brakes and turn signals, really making them a safety item. One of the most distinctive features of the 1967 was the rear. Once again inspired by the GT40, McHose took the rear deck lid and fashioned an integral rear spoiler. The team experimented with several taillight combinations, including Fairlane lights, which almost made the cut until the team settled on 1967 Cougar taillights, minus the fan covers. The rear of the Shelby was unlike anything that came out of the U.S. manufacturers of the day. While it's true that the 1967 Charger holds the title for the first car offered with a deck lid spoiler, it didn't look as nice as the Shelby. The Charger piece was an afterthought, a bolt-on. The Shelby spoiler, on the other hand, was beautiful. It was purpose-built, blends into the lines of the car, a work of automotive art. The tail was finished off with Shelby logos and a flip-open fuel cap making for an exclusive looking specialty car that looked every dollar of the sticker price. In previous years, one of the holdups to production were the many subtle touches made by hand to the 65-66 GT350s in the name of performance and looks. These touches cost valuable time, which in turn cut into the cost of building the car. And for 1967, saving money was paramount. Also, any delay or problem with any of the components would stymie production for weeks. Shelby American Solution 
was to utilize Ford's assembly line process to not only install the Shelby unique pieces during the initial build of the car, but to substitute any necessary Shelby mods with factory Ford pieces that could still serve the purpose of Shelby, but at a lower price. Now, let's take a look at the new GT350. The foundation was still the K-Code 271 horsepower solid lifter 289 V8. It received the standard Cobra aluminum intake and Holley 715 CFM four barrel carb for manual cars and the 595 CFM carb for automatic cars. However, the cars were still rated at 306 horsepower and 329 pound feet of torque in spite of the lack of headers, free flowing exhaust, and the fact that the manual and automatic cars used different carburetors. The engines were dressed up with the die cast Cobra valve covers and chrome air cleaner. Shelby went with the stock oil pan over the larger capacity aluminum Cobra pan to again save time and money. There was a Paxton supercharger available as a $700 option, only available on the GT350. It gave a sizable power boost, but the cost placed it up there with the big block cars as far as pricing was concerned, which is why they didn't sell very many of them. Air conditioning, power steering, and power brakes were installed at the factory for the first time. Unique to the car's power steering was the use of a 1967 Galaxy power steering pump. While identical dimensionally to the Mustang unit, it used a larger pulley to keep the pump from spinning too fast with the high revving 289 hypo, and the low pressure fluid for it on the pump was at a much better angle for routing the line to the front mount power steering fluid cooler. One other steering mod, Shelby American utilized an off-the-shelf steering box equipped with a quicker ratio that replaced the hand-installed custom pitman and idler arm used in the 1965 GT350. Transmission choices were carried over from the last year with a 3-speed C4 automatic or a 4-speed top loader manual. For the previous two years, the GT350s came equipped with some form of trailing arm or traction bar. Hey, I just wanted to step in right now because I wanted to thank you for taking your time to step into the GearHead Lounge and check out our videos. If you made it this far into the video, you might as well just go on ahead, like the video, and subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Hey, it's real easy. Just, just go ahead and click on this icon right here and it will subscribe you. Don't forget to turn on your post notifications every time we post a video and you won't miss a single thing from the GearHead Lounge. Okay, so back to the video. 1965 featured a set of fully welded components that required full removal of the rear end as well as some cutting into the floor pan. 1966 introduced us to traction bars made by different manufacturers that still required some welding but didn't need the rear end removed and no cutting of the car was required. In 1967, Shelby took things in a different direction by eliminating the traction bars altogether. Instead, Shelby used a set of rubber snubbers bolted to the underside of the car right above the leaf springs. The snubbers limited the amount of wrap under acceleration and thus acting as a traction bar in some form. Turning their attention to the front suspension, the stiff riding coning shocks were dropped in favor of Gabriel adjustable units. No longer were the front control arms lowered one inch, they were left in the sock location. However, a thicker front sway bar was installed as in previous years, spring rates for factory Mustang. The brakes remained unchanged from previous years 4 piston caliper Kelsey Hayes discs up front and 10 by 2 and a half inch drums in the rear. Using factory installed components not only did its job in saving money, but it also gave the car a more finished grand touring feel rather than a weekend racer feel. After all, Shelby Mustangs were fetching premium prices and Shelby American wanted to make sure that each client got their money's worth. The interior of the Shelby had to carry on the feel of a grand tour. In previous years, the interior of the GT350 was pretty stark and Shelby wanted the interior of the 67 to be on the luxurious side. After all, the car's target market was the young executive, and they're not looking to drive to work in a vehicle that sounds like a tin can on the inside. Based upon the deluxe interior of the Mustang, 
the 67 Shelby interior was a huge step up from its predecessors. The seats were now pretty plush with hard plastic backs, stainless steel trim with an optional fold down rear seat. The door panels were padded and included a molded in armrest. Rust aluminum panels adorned the doors as well as the dashboard. In previous years, one of the biggest complaints was that the interior colors were limited to one color, black. While black certainly goes with anything, they were unbearable during the summer months where the temperatures reached triple digits. With that, Shelby American added parchment as an interior option, as well as air conditioning. That could overcome any color interior. For the first time, the Mustang's deluxe gauge panel incorporated a tachometer, which was perfect for Shelby, meaning that they didn't have to add one themselves. Further given the interior a very finished look and feel. However, this didn't mean that extra gauges weren't added. They were. This is because one of the drawbacks of the deluxe interior was that the amp meter and oil gauges were demoted to idiot lights to make room for the tack. This would never do for such a high-class touring car. Gauges were needed, but they needed to be incorporated cleanly. Shelby's solution was to take the 1966 Mustang Rally Pack gauge pod, add in a pair of the needed Stuart Warner gauges, and mount it upside down below the radio. The next item addressed was the steering wheel. In 1965, Shelby swapped out the stock plastic wheel for a wood wheel. It looked nice and sporty, but lacked a horn button and was plagued with quality control issues. For 1966, Shelby used the Mustang simulated wood wheel. For 1967, Shelby went back to the Italian-made wood wheel, this time with brushed aluminum trim as well as a working horn button that incorporated the Shelby logo. For driver safety, Shelby wanted to build the safest car on the road, so they decided to include a functioning roll bar and interior. They did away with the three inch lap belts and went with the Mustang's deluxe belts and incorporated the old Cobra logo in the button. Shelby even took things one step further. As told by Fred Goodell, he was at the airfield and looked inside the cockpit of an Air Force F-105 Thunder Chief fighter bomber. In the seat, he noticed a shoulder harness connected to an inertia reel above it. He got to the office, called up Edwards Air Force Base, and spoke to the commanding general. After explaining who he was, what he was working on, and how much he liked the seatbelt harness, the CG was all too happy to have an F-105 seat delivered to the Shelby facility the next day. After a fair amount of research and engineering, Shelby managed to incorporate a shoulder harness with an inertia reel that closely resembled the same harness that was in the F-105. The harness slipped on like a jacket and worked in conjunction with the lap belts to form a four-point system. The inertia reels allowed the driver to move around but cinched tight under braking. Shelby American offered overall 10 colors for 1967, but customers were only offered five choices at any given time based on buyer demand. These choices were Burnt Amber, Acapulco Blue, Brittany Blue, Night Mist Blue, Candy Apple Red, Lime Gold, Raven Black, Charcoal Gray, Dark Moss Green, and Wimbledon White. The Moss Stripes, officially referred to as Rally Stripes, were offered as an option, and it's our best speculation that they were dealer installed. No paperwork has ever been found actually verifying that they were ever applied at the factory. Every colored car received white side stripes, except for the Wimbledon white cars, which received blue side stripes. One quick tidbit of information on the side stripes, instead of being centered on the front fender like previous years, the lettering was placed as far back as possible on the fender. It's unknown as to why this was done, or if it was changed during production, because I've seen 67 Shelby's where the lettering was centered. Perhaps the stripe is a 68 stripe, because the lettering was back to being centered that year. Shelby American was also planning for another run of 1000 GT350H Hertz rental cars, which would account for all of the Raven black cars while simultaneously serving as a homologation effort for the GT350R model as well. However, 
Hertz canceled their order at the last minute, which meant no R model. Shelby still worked with Ford to build about 25 Mustang coupes to compete in Trans Am Group 2. Shelby American went with a steel wheel for the base wheel, dressed up with 1967 Thunderbird wheel covers. They closely resembled Magnum 500 wheels and looked pretty good for wheel covers. They were finished up with the Shelby Cobra emblem for the center cap. However, a grand touring car needs alloy wheels. Less unsprung weight for better handling, and they look awesome. Shelby offered two options. The first option was the Kelsey Hayes Magstar wheel, steel rims with a five-spoke aluminum center. They were an attractive wheel that were installed on the most number of cars. The second option was a continuation of the 10-spoke aluminum wheel made for the 66 GT350s, but in a 15-inch version over the previous year's 14-inch design. All three wheel choices came with the Shelby Cobra Center. All wheels came wrapped in Goodyear E7015 Speedway 350 tires. The plan for production of the 1967 Shelby was similar to the previous years. Ford was going to build the cars as far as they could and then deliver them to Shelby American where they added the front and rear body parts, the scoops, trunk lid, tail lights, wheels, etc. As production begins on the Shelbys, they were immediately hit with production woes, or launch problems in corporate speak. When they received the first batch of noses, they wouldn't fit correctly on the front of the cars. The gaps were horrendous. It didn't make sense how things could have been so far off. This halt in production prompted Ford to step in. They enlisted Dr. Ray Geddes, who took control of operations and ordering, and brought in Fred Goodell as chief engineer later in that year. John Kerr was also sent from Ford to be the new general manager of Shelby American. After some research, they found the problem was the shell they used to make the clay prototypes was slightly twisted. While they were aware that the shell was used for seatbelt testing, they had no idea how aggressive the testing was. It was apparently enough to twist the unibody so much that any pieces produced using that shell was going to be off. A lot. To stick to the production schedule, the crew at Shelby American had to hand foot every nose to each car until a solution could be found. With the help of A.O. Smith Plastics in Ionia, Michigan, they came up with a temporary two-piece nose that helped to keep production going until they can get things back on track. Now, Ford designed the new Mustang to accept a big block engine to keep up with the competition which completely opened the door for Shelby American to join in with a big block model of their own. So, all while Shelby was developing the GT350 and Charlie was wrangling Mustang shells through the offices, they were simultaneously working on a big block version as well, a big block GT350. The final design of the new Mustang wasn't 100% complete at the time, but they did have all of the mechanicals worked out and that allowed for Shelby American to do some research and development. Shelby American took Shelby serial number 5R537, an unsold 65 GT350R model, and replaced the front subframes, shock towers, and engine compartment panels with 1967 pieces supplied by Ford. Between the new shock towers, they stuffed a 427 side oiler race engine, the same power plant in the Le Mans winning Mark II GT40s. A reverse teardrop hood was used for clearance and the wheel openings were widened up to clear the wheels and tires. They took the beast of a car to Willow Springs Raceway for testing and the only thing faster was Dan Gurney in a Mark II GT40. Needless to say, the crew at Shelby American got the green light to proceed with what they named at the time the 428 GT350. In the Mustang, Ford decided to go with the 390 FE engine, which was good for 320 horsepower. But if Shelby American wanted their GT car to be different, they had to make more power. While they used the 427 side oiler in their test car, a race engine didn't seem like the right engine for the type of car they wanted to build. Plus, they were expensive to use compared to other engines of comparable size. Fortunately, Ford did have an engine lying around that they could possibly use, 
and it was the right size at 428 cubic inches. Now, contrary to popular belief, Shelby did not use the 428 police interceptor engine as it came from Ford. The police interceptor engine in a stock form would prove to be too wide to fit between the shock towers of the new Mustang. They did use the police interceptor short block as the base and bolted on a set of 390 GT cylinder heads, casting number C7AE-A. These heads use a 14 bolt system for the use of Mustang exhaust manifolds made to clear the shock towers. The exhaust gases would exit utilizing the factory Mustang exhaust system with custom chrome tips exiting through the rear valance specially cut for the tips. For induction, Shelby went with an aluminum dual quad intake manifold topped off with a pair of Holley 600 CFM four barrel carburetors. The finishing touches include a pair of aluminum Cobra Le Mans valve covers and Cobra oval air cleaner. With the aforementioned modifications, this 428 was no longer the police interceptor as we know it. In engineering and marketing documents, the engine was referred to as a Special Interceptor or 428 8 Venturi Special, 428 with a Police Interceptor camshaft, 428 Cobra engine, the list goes on. But the bottom line is that the engine used is not an official Police Interceptor engine. The final product produced 355 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque, backed by either a four-speed top loader manual or the C6 automatic transmission. For most of the design phase, the big block car was known as the 428 GT350, but it was time to come up with a proper name. For the 65 GT350, the story is that Carol asked Phil Remington what the distance between the race and the production shop was, and Phil's response was about 350 feet, and that's how the GT350 got its name. This new model was a Shelby with a 428 engine. Looking at all the other cars out there, their engine sizes were 400 and 428 from Pontiac, the 426 and 440 from Chrysler, and 430 from Buick. Even Oldsmobile had a 455, and Carroll Shelby wanted something that was just bigger than anything else out there. So there was no way 428 was going to be in the name. But Carol Shelby was a sales and marketing guru and came up with the perfect sounding name, GT500. It was a nice round number and was bigger than anything anyone else had. When asked what he thought about the name, Carol said, I just sort of looked at the sound of it and the way it would look on those rocker panel stripes. Hey, never doubt the marketing prowess of Carol Shelby. With the overall design finalized and the name secure, Shelby American got to work on getting the car seen by the public. In September of 1966, the team took what was believed to be a Clearwater Aqua 289 GTA Fastback and converted it to serial number 0176, a lime gold GT350. Later that same month, that same team used a red GT500 test mule, later to be known as asset number 67ST102 and used them both for advertising. Both of these cars still exist today. Up until now, all of the 67 Shelby's produced were GT350s, and a little less than 100 have been built. But finally, Shelby pulled the trigger in November and kicked off GT500 production. The first three production GT500s, a fastback, coupe, and convertible, serial numbers 0100, 0131 and 0139, all identically equipped, were purposed for marketing and research. These were the first production Shelbys to be painted candy apple red. The coupe and convertible were to be introduced mid-year, but those plans were tossed before their production. Number 0100, not to be confused with asset number 67ST102, which was a prototype, 0100 was the first production GT500 to be built on the assembly line, complete with a VIN, and was the first GT500 to be built with air conditioning. It holds the distinction of the first production GT500 fastback to be painted candy apple red. It was used for public relations as it served as the test car 
for the February issues of Car and Driver and Road and Track magazine. At the time, they didn't have any GT500 emblems made, so with a razor blade and some scotch tape, they modified a set of GT350 badges to read GT500 for the sake of the magazine articles. Of all the advertising cars, number 100 probably saw the most photo shoots, having been photographed for Car and Driver, Road and Track, Motor Trend, and Sports Car Graphic magazines. It's currently owned by Eric Johnson, who's owned it for over 40 years. 40 years. Nice fun fact, both the convertible and the coupe ended up being pretty famous. The 0139 drop top became Carroll Shelby's personal car for a while, although it was later revealed that one of the ladies that worked in the upstairs executive office drove it way more than Shelby did. It was updated with 68 prototype fiberglass and photographed for several brochures as a 68 model. During its tenure with Shelby, it was reported stolen, but miraculously found a few days later. It appears that it was some kind of ploy by Shelby American to acquire the 68 update body parts from Ford for free. The convertible was eventually sold as a used car, but thankfully sought out found and restored back to 67 specs by Billups Classic Cars and is now in the care of Brian Stiles. The 0131 Coupe also led a pretty storied life. The GT500 Coupe was mainly for public relations but also sported some experimental pieces. The most well-known modification came in the form of the dual Paxton blower setup. The Coupe was officially named XP500, but the world knew it as Little Red, and it became a legend in the streets. It was thought to have been crushed after the 1967 model year, but it was actually sold as a used car, fell into disrepair over the years, and ended up in a field. It was found by Jason Billups and restored by Billups Classic Cars. It's now part of Craig Jackson's car collection. All three cars rate among some of the rarest cars in the world. Getting back to production, the 67 Shelby suffered from more issues as more cars got out on the streets. Two instances of note were the center mounted high beams and the eye level brake and turn signal lights, both of which were illegal in several states. This is unacceptable! Fred Goodell recounts the verbal berating he received from California officials as well as having to meet with administrators from every state in the union for quite a few uncomfortable conversations. Goodell moved the high beams outboard and eliminated the scoop lights altogether and made the changes post haste. Other production changes were to the front grill which changed numerous times. Multiple companies handled the fiberglass production and that really hurt consistency of the product. The hoods not only randomly switched up between having side gills and not having side gills, but also the early hoods utilized the 67 steel framing, while later hoods were manufactured with a more traditional inside bracing. Both used the factory Mustang hood latch. The story was the same for the trunk lids. The taillight panel suffered from major leakage problems and was redesigned twice to combat the issue. These few observations were merely a small sampling of the running changes Shelby made in the production run. There are many more changes to either address the supply issue, manufacturing issue, or warranty issue. Now, unless you're a dyed-in-the-wool Shelby fan, you'd probably think like I did and conclude that they only made one GT500 equipped with a 427 side oiler. I mean, it's been all over the magazine since forever, so why would they be wrong? Don't worry, you're not kicked out of the Shelby Club, but you merely have your feet wet when it comes to the vast ocean of all things Shelby. The truth is that there were three documented GT500s that left Shelby American equipped with the 427. All three started out as 428 cars, and Shelby American swapped them out for the 427 lightweight Le Mans engine. We all know about serial number 0544, the white with blue stripes Shelby GT500 that acquired the name the Super Snake. It was shipped to Texas for high speed testing of Goodyear's new Thunderbolt tires. It averaged 142 miles an hour for 500 miles and clocked the top speed of 170 miles an hour. But that was actually the second 427 Shelby built. 
The first one was serial number 0289. It was specifically built for a customer in New York that had previously owned a 427 Cobra. After completion, the owner flew to California to pick up the car at Shelby American and drove it back to New York. The third 427 car, serial number 1947, was a home office reserve car on loan from Ford. After it returned to Ford, the 427 was swapped in and the Shelby became a factory drag car. All other 427 equipped Shelbys were either dealer installed, blown engine replacements, or engine swaps by the owner. Either way, a 427 Shelby is pretty cool. Even though Shelby American was building cars, they were dealing with many production issues. As I mentioned earlier, the company started with a huge projected operating loss. Even with the Ford executives directing operations, the 67 model run still suffered problems with the front fiberglass fitment, the random hood gills, the headlight issues, the scoop light issues, and tail light panel issues. It was just too much for Ford to watch. And by April of 67, they called in their debt and acquired Shelby American lock, stock, and barrel. But this new acquisition wasn't going to save the 67 production effort. The 68 Shelby model year was already a done deal and it was going to be run by Ford. This meant that Ford had to get a few things in order. Previously, Shelby received a ton of help from A.O. Smith Plastics when the noses wouldn't fit correctly. They were already manufacturing Corvette bodies for Chevrolet, a contract that was going to be ending for the 68 model year. So, A.O. Smith was the choice to take over the fiberglass production for the Shelby 68 model year. By June, Ford shut down Shelby American and created three new companies, Shelby Automotive Company, Shelby Parts Company, and Shelby Racing Company. Shelby Automotive was moved to Southfield, Michigan, with the actual car final assembly taking place at A.O. Smith Plastics. Shelby Racing Company and Shelby Parts Company moved to Torrance, California. Shelby Parts Company was later renamed Shelby Autosports and moved to Detroit. Shortly after the acquisition, all built unsold cars received a Z stamped into the Shelby American VIN plate. It was not exactly clear as to why they were stamped in such a way, but our best guess is that they are marked as Ford assets at the time of the transition. Remember, Shelby didn't pay for the cars until they were sold, so they still belonged to Ford.